thank you all for being here. Some of your faces do look familiar to me because I have uh, uh, part of my job is to do enforcement. A couple of you have seen me there, and I've also seen some of you in your facilities when I've been surveying. So welcome. Uh, and as I said, as Bonnie mentioned, this is to go through the rules that will be in effect as of October 1. The rules uh, started out uh, based on our, well, it was actually based on law, but it is in keeping with the strategic priorities for the Department of Health. One of those uh, priorities, as you can see listed there, is integrating a physical and behavioral health services and part of that is integrating the rules as well as integrate, integrating the licensing process and therefore we have to integrate those rules. And as you'll see, if you have looked at the rules, you will see that there are behavioral health components in several of the rules so that we can allow for that and we will no longer have a behavioral health licensing bureau. It will be integrated into medical for the acute side and for the residential side. It will be integrated with the residential people. Um, so that is basically where some of the changes have come from. But then as we went to, uh, excuse me, uh, the legislature, of course, to have the rules changed, we have to go through the legislature. And uh, they had, the legislature gave us the directive that on or before July 1 of 2013, we had to reduce the monetary or regulatory costs on persons or individuals, streamline the regulation process, and then facilitate licensure of integrated health programs that, in, that provide both behavioral and physical health services. The new integrated rules are um, in R, excuse me, 9 AAC, which is the Arizona uh, Administrative Code 10, and we'll focus on, on the health and safety first, and provide regulatory consistency for all health institutions. And you'll find some sections that we will go over that are going to be consistent across the board, things like infection control and, uh, and quality review. Those are included in all provider types now. Uh, streamline the regulatory process and integrate behavioral and physical health services. Make changes delineated in our five-year review ports, reports. And the new integrated rules. The facility will be licensed based on the highest level of services it provides. So if it is basically a behavioral health facility and they've added uh, the uh, medical component, it will be based, their license will be based on their, the fact that they are providing uh, behavioral health services and vice versa. Facilities will be able to offer a menu of services and those, all the medical services will be provided under a direction of a physician. All nursing services will be provided under the direction of a registered nurse. All behavioral health services will be provided under the direction of a licensed behavioral health professional. And all behavioral health technicians and behavioral health paraprofessionals will receive supervision or clinical oversight from a licensed behavioral health uh, professional. The timeline is that these rules were filed with the Secretary, Secretary of State on June 28th, and the implementation of those new rules, as you know, starts as of October 1. What does this mean for you? I'm sure you already realize this. You need to start following those rules as of October 1 and uh, provide, which provide the facilities with more flexibility for policies and procedures and staffing and training. If you've looked at the new rules, you'll see there are a lot of those reference policies and procedures um, much more significantly than you had in the current rules. For more information, you can, you can uh, visit our rules implementation website, and I believe that's the website that you have on that small card that we, you were, looks like a little business card. And you can see there it is azdhs.gov forward slash ALS forward slash integrated and forward slash. And when you go on that website you will, uh, for outpatient surgery centers, you'll look for the OSC rule. The other area that you will want to look at very specifically is uh, Article 1. Article 1 in, on that web page is called General. It's the general article that has a lot of the definitions. Um, the different rule sets had sets of definitions uh, for specific, uh, for each rule set. And now we've taken those definitions that are common across the board for all, um, all the providers and put it just in Article 1, as well as some of the other uh, issues such as licensing. That's all in Article 1 unless there is something specific to the provider type of the rules. We're looking 
Uh, as you see, as, if you get onto that website, you will see crosswalks, frequently asked questions, flowcharts for licensing process, access to the draft rules. Well, they aren't draft anymore. They're now called the unofficial rule. When you see unofficial, they are the actual rules. They're called unofficial because the Secretary of State has not posted them yet. But they are the rules, even though it says unofficial at this point. The actual official rules have all the strike throughs, and they're hard to read through because the strike throughs every strike throughs all the things that they uh, that are not in the same places or have been deleted. Uh, provider trainings and meetings are those dates are on there, and then oops, I'm sorry, go back. We have the online videos and the PowerPoints that will be posted on there and archived on there for the things that we're doing now. And as you can see, we are taping this this today. So if you can save your questions to the end, we'd be happy to have, have questions and comments when we get done. That way, we'll be able to complete this uh, taping and won't we'll have to include a lot of extra time on it. One other thing that you will find now on those rules, when you go and find the rules uh, on the website, is as we go through the rules, you'll see that there are references to the law, uh, the Arizona Revised Statute. I believe it's on, the, on their website now, on the, each of those rules, that you can click on that reference to the ARS, whatever it happens to be, and it's a hyperlink, so that you can, it will automatically be able to pull up and see what that law is because a lot of your requirements now are not only based on, but are actually um, delineated in the law itself and in the statute. And this is just an example of the crosswalk that we defined there. And once again, there's the website. And what has changed in article, I mean, in R910, article, uh, it's not article six for you, this was put together for a separate group, but I'm using this because it has some good general slides. Review of each of the rules, we'll go through the rules, we'll go through uh, the contents have changed in some cases, definitions, additions are there, and interpretations have changed. The article number, the, the address where you're going to find the rules have changed, and some of those um, sections under the article have changed as well, so we'll go through that. Foundation for the rules, as I've mentioned before, is the Arizona Revised Statute. We have the law, which comes first, and then those uh, rules, administrative code, are based on the statute. Okay, so we will start on the actual unofficial rules for the outpatient treatment centers, or, I mean, say outpatient surgical centers. And you can see it's Article 9. And I highlighted, you'll see that I've highlighted in gold or brown, however you want to call that, uh, those items which are new uh, or which have changed significantly. And for the specific sections, the contracted services is a new section. There was not a section in the current rules, and there, neither was there a section for transfer in the current rules. And of course, behavioral health services was not in the current was not in the current rules. And there wasn't a section specific to medication services either or infection control. Uh, certainly, as you know, there's plenty of infection control direction when you're looking at Medicare, but this is specific to state rules. So we will start with definitions, which is the first section, 901. And if, if I remember correctly, these are the only, yeah, these are the only definitions that are left in this rule set for outpatient surgery centers. Um, and you can see, as it mentions there, the, uh, the other definitions that would apply across the board are in ARS 36401, at, which is the statute, and then R910101, which is Article 1. The things that you have here now that are left in, in the rules, which were actually, which are in the current rules, is inpatient care means post-surgical services provided in a hospital. Outpatient surgical services means anesthesia and surgical services provided to a patient in an outpatient surgical center. And the surgical suite means an area of an outpatient surgical center that includes one or more operating rooms and one or more recovery rooms. Under administration, I don't, we don't have a lot of changes until we get down, uh, the section is, let me say that is 902. They're not, as you can see, there are not a lot of changes there until we get down under num uh, item number seven, designate an acting administrator in writing who has the qualifications established in subsection A to B, which was uh, which we just scrolled through? If the administrator is B, not present on on the outpatient surgical center's premise for more than 30 days, you need to uh, make sure that you have that designated in writing. 
And then under um, the administrator, uh, the item number three, uh, B3 is new. That administrator, except as provided in section A8, will des shall designate in writing an individual who is on outpatient surgical center's premise, premises and is available and accountable for the services when the administrator is not present on the outpatient surgical center's premises. The administrator shall ensure that, number one, is new policies and procedures are established, documented, and implemented. And of course, the uh, item that we look for when surveyors come is, ab is absolutely the implementation. All of the items under that uh, policy and procedures are not new to you. They are in the current rules. And the next item that is new to, your, to the rules is under number three, ensure that policies and procedures are not only available to personnel members, employees, volunteers, and students, but also reviewed at least every two years and updated as needed. Once again, we scroll through until, because there are no changes there, until we get to the quality management uh, section, which is 903. Under quality management, the administrator shall ensure that the plan is established, documented, and implemented for an ongoing quality management program. That verbiage is a little different than what you have in your present rules. And then the items that are included in that are not new to you, except under number C and D and F. It needs to include a, a method to evaluate the data collected to identify a concern about the delivery of services related to patient care. B, a method to make changes or take action as a result of the identification of a concern about delivery of services related to patient care. And the frequency of submitting a documented report required in subsection 2 to the governing body. So again, we'll scroll through and we get down to item number three, which is the last item under that section. The report required in section two and the supporting documentation for that report are maintained for 12 months after the date the report is submitted to the governing body. And we get to the section uh, 904, which is entirely new for you. And it is short. <laughs> Contracted services and administrators shall ensure that contracted services are provided according to requirements in this article, and a documented list of current contracted services is maintained that includes a description of the contracted services provided. Next session is uh, personnel, and we do have some new things in that section. Qualification, skills, knowledge required for each type of patient, uh, the administrator will ensure that, and it would, uh, that should be based on the type of physical health services or behavioral health services expected to be provided by the personnel member or according to the job, established job description and the acuity of the patients receiving the physical health services or the behavioral health services from the personnel member according to the established job description. And you may, might guess that that is, if you will, boilerplate language that we've put across the board to all of the providers. It will include I, uh, or little i, the specific skills and knowledge necessary for personnel members uh, to provide the expected physical health services and behavioral health services listed in the established job description, the type and the duration of the education that will allow that personnel member to acquire the specific skills and knowledge for the personnel member to provide expected physical health services or behavioral health services listed in the established job description, and triple I, the type and duration of experience that will allow the, that personnel member to acquire specific skills and knowledge for the personnel member to provide with the expected health, health care, uh, for physical health services or behavioral health services listed in the established job description. A, person, a, a personnel member's skills and knowledge are verified and documented before the personnel member provides physical health services or behavioral health services. That is new to your rules. Uh, under item three, personnel members are present on outpatient on an outpatient surgical center's premises with qualifications, skills, and knowledge necessary to a provide services in the outpatient surgical center's scope of service. 
meet the needs of the patient, and ensure the health and safety of, that patient, of the patient. Number four, a personnel member before the personnel member provides services to a patient, and, and an employee or a volunteer who has or is expected to have more than eight weeks of direct interaction with a patient provides evidence of freedom from infectious tuberculosis as specified in R910.112, that is Article 1 again. Number five, there should be a plan to provide orientation. And then number six, uh, a personnel member completes that orientation before providing behavioral health services or physical health services. And then number seven, an individual's orientation is documented, and it will include, as you already have rules that speak to that, uh, the name, the date of orientation, the subject, top, topics covered, et cetera. And number eight, a plan to provide in-service education specific to the job duties of a personnel member is developed, documented, and implemented. And number nine, a personnel member's in-service education is documented, and it should be inclusive of the items that are listed there, which are already in your current rules. And once again, we'll scroll down the, through the items that are not new to these rules. This will take us to... The medical staff, and there are. This is not necessarily new, but there is some rewording and reorganizing of the content. Uh, the content remained the same, but the, there's reorganization of the information. So I don't. Uh, I won't be going through that specifically. Under admission, uh, you can see we don't have uh, new issues, new things to list it in the admission rules that you currently have at all. And we get to the new, a whole new section, which is. 908, and that's the transfer. Except for transfer of a patient due to an emergency, an administrator shall ensure that, number one, a personnel member coordinates the transfer and services provided to the patient. Two, according to policy and procedures, an evaluation of the patient is conducted before the transfer. Medical records, including orders that are in effect at the time of the transfer, are provided to a receiving facility or care institution. A personnel member explains the risks and benefits of transfer to the patient or the patient's representatives, and documentation in the patient's medical records include a communication with an individual at the receiving healthcare institution, the date and time of the transfer, the mode of transportation, and if applicable, a personnel member accompanying the patient during that transfer. So all of that is new for you. Once again, under patient rights, there's, a, uh, there's some of that information is uh, not new, but, uh, but it has been reorganized. And then I have, you can see the highlighted items that are new. Under section A2, the new item is, at the time of admission, a patient or the patient's representative receives a written copy of the requirements in subsection B and the patient's rights in subsection C. And number three, there are policies and procedures that include how and when a patient or a patient's representative is informed of patient rights in subsection C, and where patient rights are posted as required in subsection A1. Uh, and then the patient rights, uh, you have all of those that, um, none of those are new to you, you already have those in your <coughs> rules. Uh, misappropriation of personal, private property, I believe that is all in your rules. <coughs> and the patient being informed of the policies and procedures, uh, patient complaint co process, that is already in your current rules. Uh, down to C, a patient has the following rights, and we have those listed. There are, you can see under number four, they have, uh, once again, the reference to the Arizona Revised Statute, several of them here. And as I mentioned, when you see this on the website, you should be able to click on that, get the hyperlink. And, and really look at those statutes, and I would encourage you to do that, to look at what the statute says. Next section is uh, 910, and it's medical records. I don't have anything new there until we get down to what an order should include. Um, there sh the administrator shall ensure that an order is dated when the order is entered in the patient's medical record and includes the time of the order. Another item that is new is if the order is verbal order, it's authenticated by the medical staff issuing that order. 
And number six is also new, which is an information, information in a patient's medical record is d disclosed to an individual not authorized under subsection five only if the written consent of a patient only, see, only with the written consent of a patient or the patient's representative, or as permitted by law. Once again, we'll scroll down through uh, the medical record con uh, contents. That's not new to you. It's in your rules. Only thing, uh, the things that we find that are new to your rules under documentation of medic is under documentation of medication administration of patient. It includes not only the time and date, name, uh, dose strength and route, but also for a medication administered for pain, an assessment of the patient's pain before administering the medication, and the effect of the medication administered. And the same uh, uh, applies for psychotropic medication, an assessment of the patient's behavior before the administration of the psychotropic medication, and the effect of that psychotropic medication. The identification, signature, and professional designation of the individual administering or observing the self-administration of, of medication. Then we come to section 911, which is surgical services. And we, the, the first item that is a uh, little bit that is new for you is under A2, a chronological register of the surgical procedures performed in the outpatient surgical center is maintained for at least two years after the date of the last entry. Under B, an administrator shall ensure that the roster of medical staff who have clinical privileges at the outpatient surgical center is available to the medical staff, specifying the privileges and the limitation of each medical staff member on the roster. Under D, the administrator shall ensure that a physician remains on the premises until all patients are discharged from the recovery room. That takes us to the next section which is 9.12 under nursing services. Uh, and, and number one is new to you under nursing services, and that is, is responsible for the management, that is the administrator, shall appoint a registered nurse as the director of nursing who is responsible for the management of the outpatient surgical center's nursing services. That person, the director of nursing, should ensure that the policies and procedures are established documented and implemented for nursing services provided in the outpatient surgical center. Ensure that the outpatient surgical center is staffed with nursing personnel based on the number of patients, the patient's health care needs, and the outpatient surgical center's scope of services. Number five is also new. To ensure that the that, uh, that director of nursing designates a registered nurse in writing to manage an outpatient surgical center's nursing services when the director of nursing is not present on the uh, outpatient surgical center's premises. That will take us to 913, which is the behavioral health section. If an outpatient surgical center provides behavioral health services, an administrator shall ensure, and there is a difference between medical health, I mean, uh, behavioral health services and behavioral health care. Behavioral health services would include counseling, that kind of thing. If a outpatient surgical center provides behavioral health services, an administrator shall ensure that the policies and procedures are established, documented, and implemented that cover when informed consent is required and by whom informed consent may be given and that the behavioral health services are provided under the direction of a behavioral health professional and to comply with the requirements for behavioral health care professionals, behavioral health technicians in R9, 10, 1, 1, 4, which again is Article 1, and for an assessment in R9, 10, 101, excuse me, 1, 1011, 1011B. Takes us to medication services, and as I mentioned, that entire section is new for you in the, in the rules. This is section 914. An administrator shall ensure an outpatient surgical center has policies and procedures for medication administration that include a process for providing information to a patient about the medication prescribed for the patient, including the prescription medicate, the prescribed medication's anticipated results, 
the prescribed medication's potential adverse reaction and the prescribed medication's potential side effects, as well as potential adverse reaction that could result from not taking the medication as prescribed. Procedures for preventing, responding to, and reporting to a medication error, an adverse response to a medication or medication overdose, and procedures to ensure that a patient's medication regimen is reviewed by a medical practitioner and meets the patient's needs. Number two, specify a process for review through the quality management program of a medication administration error and an, and an adverse reaction to medication. Under Section B, administrators shall ensure that policies and procedures for medication administration are reviewed and approved by medical examiner, excuse me, medical practitioner, uh, B, specify the individual who may order that medication and administer the medication. And you can see in the new section of uh, medication administration, even though it's a new section, there are some issues, although you didn't have a section called medication administration, but they were already in the current rules. Under number three, medication administered to a patient is administered in compliance with an order. And then under C, one and two, an administrator shall ensure that a current drug reference guide is available for use by personnel members. And the current toxicology reference guide is available for use by personnel members. And then we get down to section D, or item D, when medication is stored at the outpatient surgical center, an administrator shall ensure that there is a separate room or closet or self-contained unit is used for medication storage that includes a lockable door. If a separate room or closet is used for storing medication, a locked cabinet is used for the, for the medication storage. And number three, medication is stored according to the instructions on the medication container. Policies and procedures are, are established, documented, and implemented for receiving, storing, inventorying, tracking, dispensing, and discarding medication, including expired medication. And discarding or returning packages, uh, prepackaged and sample medication to a manufacturer if the manufacturer requests the, dis the discard or return of the medication. Also, a medication recall and notification of patients who received recall, who received recalled medication, and D, storing, inventorying, and dispensing controlled substances. The last part of the medication section is E, an administrator shall ensure that a personnel member immediately reports a medication error to a pa or a patient over adverse reaction to a medication to the medical practitioner who ordered that medication and, is, and if applicable, the outpatient surgical center's director of nursing. And we come to another new section, which is infection control. Uh, under the administra A, an administrator shall ensure that an infection control program is established under the direction of an individual qualified according to the policies and procedures to prevent the development and transmission of infections and communicable diseases, including a method to identify and document infections occurring at the outpatient surgical center, analysis of the types, causes, and spread of infections and communicable diseases at the outpatient surgical center, the development of, a correct, of corrective measures to minimize or prevent the spread of infections and communicable diseases at the outpatient surgical center, and documenting infection control activities, including the collection and analysis of, infe of infection control data, the actions taken to related to infectious and communicable diseases, and reports of communicable diseases to the governing authority and the state and county health departments. Infection control documentation is maintained for at least two years after the date of the documentation. Policies and procedures are established, documented, and implemented that cover, and here we have a list, compliance with the, with the requirements in um, Arizona Administrative Code 6 for reporting and control measures for communicable diseases and infestations. Handling and disposal of biohazardous medical waste, sterilization, disinfection, 
distribution and storage of medical equipment and supplies, use of personal, yeah, personal protective equipment such as aprons, gloves, gowns, masks, or face protection when applicable, training of uh, personnel members, employees, and volunteers in infection uh, control policies, and work restrictions for a personnel member with a communicable disease or infectious skin, or infected skin lesion. Number four, biohazardous medical waste is identified, stored, and disposed of according to um, Arizona Administrative Code 13, Article 14, and the policies and procedures. Uh, so, soiled linen and clothing are collected in a manner to minimize or prevent contamination, bagged at the site of use, and maintained separate from clean linen and clothing. And number six, a personnel member, employee, or volunteer washes hands or use of hand disinfection product after the patient con after patient contact and after handling soiled linen, soiled clothing, or potentially infectious material. An administrator shall comply with the cont contagious disease reporting requirements of AR IRS 36621 uh, and communicable diseases require reporting requirements in the Arizona uh, Administrative Code 6, Article 2. And that uh, completes the infection control section. We come to uh, 916, which is the emergency and safety standards. The administrator shall ensure the policies and procedures for providing medical emergency treatment to a patient are established, documented, and implemented, and include a list of medications, supplies, and equipment required on the premises for the medical emergency treatment provided by the outpatient surgical center. A system to ensure medication supplies and equipment are available, have not been tampered with, and if, and if applicable, have not expired. A requirement that a cart or a container is available for medical, and, uh, medical emergency treatment that contains medications, supplies, and equipment specified in policies and procedures. A method to verify and document that Doc, that the contents of the cart or container are available for medical emergency treatment, and a method for ensuring a patient may be transported to a hospital or other healthcare institution to receive treatment for a medical emergency that the outpatient surgical center is not able to authorize or authorized to provide. And I believe that is the last of the new ones in that particular section. The next section is the environmental standards. And we don't have, uh, we'll, we'll scroll down to where we have something new in the environmental standards, and that comes down to item number six. Heating and cooling systems maintain the, uh, maintain the outpatient treatment center at a temperature between 70, Fahrenheit, 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 84 degrees Fahrenheit at all times. We'll talk after we get done. Common areas. We can talk. We'll, we'll talk when we get there. And this, this is again, is is something that is consistent across the board with several types of providers. And we're talking about common areas. Common areas are lighted to assure safety of patients and have lighting sufficient to allow personnel members to monitor patient activity. Uh, under B is the uh, the last item under that section, and that is new. An administrator shall ensure that an outpatient surgical center has a functional emergency power source. Now we're down to the um, section on physical plant standards, section 918. And I don't believe we have anything new until we get down to section D under there. That is, an administrator may provide chairs in the recovery area that allow a patient to recline for patients who have not received general anesthesia. And E, an administrator shall ensure that the following are available in the surgical site. Oxygen and the means of administration. Mechanical ventilator assistant equipment, including airways, manual breathing bag, and suction apparatus. Cardiac monitor, defibrillator, and cardiopulmonary resuscitation drugs as determined by policy and procedure. And that 
brings us to the end of the outpatient treatment, outpatient surgical center rules. As you can see, there weren't a whole lot of new, there were a few new things. Uh, and I'll give you some time for 